So <laughs> let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, we're grateful to the Hogue Family Cancer Institute for their sponsorship of the Nixon National Cancer Conference, and especially for their sponsorship of today's luncheon. The Hogue Family Cancer Institute is located in Newport Beach, California, and boasts the largest phase one clinical trials program in Orange County. To introduce our keynote speaker, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Burton Eisenberg, the Grace E. Hogue Executive Medical Director Endowed Chair at the Hogue Family Cancer Institute. He is responsible for strategic planning and the Hogue partnership with the USC Keck School of Medicine and leads the development of world-class cancer programs for the Orange County community. Please welcome Dr. Eisenberg. Thank you. Um, it's my uh, pleasure to represent Hogue and the Hogue Family Cancer uh, Center during this conference. Uh, the Hogue Cancer Program is a community-based program. It's grown quite considerably over the past decade. We now see uh, and care for well over 4,000 new cancer patients per year. And as has been uh, noted uh, in this morning, about 80 to 85 percent of cancer patients in the United States are seen and managed uh, in community cancer centers. It's important, uh, if you know anything about Orange County, um, if you're a new cancer patient or a cancer patient undergoing active therapy, what, the last thing you want to do is uh, get in the car uh, and take the two-hour drive uh, to L.A. So, Having a, uh, uh, a complete cancer program within the community uh, has uh, really, I think, been an important uh, additive. Um, I'm also quite proud of the fact that we have developed and, and resourced a considerable effort in cancer research combined with strategic recruitment of a cadre of physician scientists. Uh, this provides uh, and has been providing for a symbiotic outlet for the existing uh, and exciting translational cancer uh, science coming out of industry. Um, 100 days, uh, that's a, a pledge that we made uh, about a year ago and, and uh, was uh, discussed a little bit this morning about how to be uh, efficient in opening clinical trials. One of the problems with getting clinical trials open and uh, uh, finding eligible patients is the process of getting uh, the trial uh, from industry, getting it into the clinic, and then finally getting it approved. Uh, so we've uh, placed... Uh, a, uh, a quality improvement on 100 days, 100 days or less from the time that we uh, sign the CDA to the time we get the go letter is the goal. And uh, I think that's going to help a great deal around the country in various programs uh, in, in order to, to enhance the clinical trial uh, uh, portfolios. So it's my honor uh, to introduce today's uh, lunch speaker, particularly because he's a fellow surgical oncologist. Um, I just want to provide some background. Um, so Dr. Andrew von Eschenbach, he received his Bachelor in Science in Biology from St. Joseph University and his MD from uh, Georgetown. Um, he also uh, then served in the U.S. Naval Medical Corps with the rank of uh, lieutenant commander from uh, 68 to 71, and then began his, uh, his uh, uh, career at the University of Texas MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center in, in 1976, where he went through a, a series of progressions from urologic oncology fellow to eventually becoming chair of the Department of urology in, in 1983. He was the founding director of the uh, prostate cancer research program at the Anderson and director of the uh, GU Cancer Center as well. Um, in uh, uh, 19, uh, uh, rather in 2001, he was selected by then President George W. Bush to serve as the 12th director of the NCI. 
Uh, and and uh, finally, in, in 2006, he was actually appointed the uh, commissioner of the FDA, which he served until 2009. And following that, uh, Dr. Von Eschenbach has been very active in industry and support groups and continued his passion for working towards better therapies, particularly in the area of prostate cancer. And it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce Dr. Von Eschenbach. Thank you. Thank you, and I, I meant what Jim uh, said. Please continue to eat and enjoy uh, your lovely meal. It will not bother me or slow me down a bit, I can assure you. Uh, last night, I stood here uh, totally, completely uh, stunned, and for some of you who know me well, uh, were shocked to realize I was actually even speechless. Um, but that honor and award that was bestowed upon me by uh, the Nixon Foundation and the Nixon Library is uh, something that I deeply treasure and I am incredibly honored to be associated with this library and this foundation, especially as we uh, go forward. Presidential libraries are places of repositories of history and this is certainly one of the most beautiful ones and I think also one of the most meaningful ones. But more importantly, this Nixon Library is not only a repository of history, it is creating history. It is taking on the opportunity and the initiative to have conferences such as this, where we look back at the history of the National Cancer Institute, but we more importantly are looking at the trajectory and the future of where that history is leading us. Last year, we came together and looked at the impact that the act had on the evolution of science and the evolution of cancer care. And this year, looking more at how that progress is impacting fields of science uh, and medicine in general, like the ones we just heard about this morning in stem cells and immunology and later in, with regard to nutrition and digital science. And so we're on a trajectory, and what I want to kind of share with you uh, in the, the time we have at lunch is where that trajectory may be leading us from the perspective of the convergence that I see that's occurring uh, in both science and technology that's influencing because of the progress in cancer, because of our ability for the first time to understand the fundamental genetic and molecular and cellular mechanisms that underlie this process that we call cancer, that we're now able to expand and apply that much more broadly uh, across the whole variety of diseases and where there are new tools and new opportunities that are coming in which are going to be able to catalyze and, and rapidly accelerate that. So we know that cancer as a process has its initiation and susceptibility to the point where it progresses through local growth, metastasis, and ultimately causes the suffering and death that we see all around us. But we're also beginning to understand that we can now strategically intervene in that process and be able to find critical points along the way where we can intervene, maybe not just in a single way, but in multiple ways in which we can then either prevent, eliminate, or modulate and control that disease. And so you're beginning to hear new com commentary in the lexicon where we've moved from seeking a cure for cancer to now being able to think about, if not pr curing, preventing and even controlling modulating it so that cancer becomes a chronic disease, but one that does not cause the suffering and death that we have been so plagued by. One of the things that has helped us in beginning to understand this is the work and the progress that the National Cancer Act enabled refreshed our way of thinking about cancer. And it goes back 
to an old theory over 100 years ago by Paget, who said, uh, proposed the seed and soil hypothesis, that what was occurring with regard to cancer was this dynamic interplay between the seed, the cancer cell, or the tumor, and the soil, the host that that tumor cell found itself in. And what you've been hearing in this conference today, and what you'll hear more of a little bit later, is the progress of the past since the National Cancer Act has given us extraordinary new insights into the tumor, into the cancer cell. But it's also refreshed and opened our ability to begin to think about the soil. And whether it's the modification of the soil at the micro environment or the macro environment, we're now beginning to see that trajectory lead us to be able to solve this problem by being able to work both sides of the equation. So we heard a little bit earlier about some of the uh, inferences of the microenvironment. The fact that immune cells have to then interact with the environment that the cancer cell finds itself in, and we're learning how to control or modulate that microenvironment to be able to attack that tumor cell much more effectively. And you'll hear later about our ability to look at the total macro environment, the entire person, whether it's from their perspective of their immune system or their nutrition or also the gut microbiome. And so what we're seeing is this emergence of this opportunity and this trajectory that's taking us to an ability to see the tumor and to see the problem in a totally, completely new and more effective way. That's leading us to begin to think about taking that knowledge and applying it to much more disparate problems. And cancer research and the, and the progress that the National Cancer Act made possible has really impacted, even today, diseases, for example, such as COVID. That whole idea of the seed and the soil, the idea of the interaction between the tumor and the host, has been exactly what's played out in COVID. It's a virus. It has its own unique properties. It mutates and creates its own identities. But its outcome is very, very much dictated by the host or the person it finds itself in. And so we've seen this wide expression of COVID as to whether it's just a mild respiratory tract infection like the flu, or whether it in fact places one in an intensive care unit and creates um, a lethality. Our ability to understand that kind of dynamic interplay from cancer will help us to be able to understand that dynamic interplay between all of the other disease entities, both acute and chronic. More often, or moreover, beside that, the progress over the past 50 years has really enabled science and technology to evolve in many other ways and in other, many other areas. And what I want to kind of emphasize going forward is this idea of convergence, that we're beginning to see these other uh, advances come into the opportunity to be able to transform our entire way of approaching cancer. So to be specific, this, I want to point out two areas in which that's occurring by virtue of the integration of the physical sciences and the life sciences. You heard a discussion last night about the role of physics and mathematics. And it is true that with the understanding of these fundamental mechanisms of, of cancer, Biology has become a digital science. We now are able to begin to understand elements of, of information and data that we can now process and be able to utilize in a way of data management that's enabling us to begin to understand cancer not just simply as an event, but more importantly, uh, as a process. One of the other really important areas of convergence for cancer in, in, in terms of the integration of the life sciences is to begin to see 
that there are fundamental underlying mathematical principles that govern the biological outcomes that we observe. And there are uh, aspects of physics that are also operative in what we view as biology. There are physical, physics principles that, and mathematical principles that govern, for example, uh, the protein folding that occurs that's responsible for functions with regard to cell. And that field is opening up enormous opportunities in understanding protein misfolding diseases such as that occurs in Alzheimer's disease. There are mathematical principles underlying biology, and some of you in the room may be familiar with the term Fibonacci numbers. But way back in a couple centuries ago, a mathematician came up with the idea of the series of taking numbers, one and two, adding them together and continuing to add the, the subsequent number so that you get a series. That series, if you uh, divide the former by the latter, gives you a ratio that's constant of 1.6. I didn't intend to give you a lesson in mathematics, but that fundamental underlying sequence of numbers and that golden ratio determines and dictates the geometric formulation of a nautilus shell, the branching of a tree, the, uh, the arrangement of petals in a flower, and the design of the human face. And so what we're beginning to see is that this convergence of science, math, physics, engineering are enabling us to see biology through an entirely new prism and begin to integrate and converge our knowledge of basic biological processes and our knowledge of the underlying uh, physical laws and dimensions. The other area that's quite, I think, for me, interesting is with regard to our understanding of these physical, uh, the physical sciences, is the application of physical energy to biological systems. Western medicine has traditionally kind of perceived the cell as a bag of fluid in which, in an aqueous state, chemical reactions occur. And so if we want to perturb the biological processes of a cell, alter the energetics that are occurring driving those things, we tend to do that pharmacologically with a drug. So it is a chemical model of a cell based on the fact we think of it as a, a bag of fluid. If you think a little bit about Eastern medicine, there tends to be a perception of the cell as a solid state, similar to what you might think of as a transistor or a microprocessor, in which the cell structure is able to then communicate with the biological functions through electromagnetic energy. And that has led us to begin to understand that when we apply physical energy to a biological system, we get a dynamic re interaction, which we've used mostly for the purposes of getting diagnostic um, outputs. So x-rays, sound for ultrasound, magnetic fields for MR MRIs, We've used those to perturb that system to get a readout that gives us an image. But what we're learning more and more through this kind of research we've catalyzed is that applying that physical energy is actually perturbing the biology of that cell. The most gross example of that is, if you will, the application of ultrasound at that's focused and of high energy to basically denature the protein and cook a cell. There's also being able to modulate the ultrasound in a way that instead of producing heat in the cell, it produces cavitation and essentially blows up the cell or shreds it. And that is giving us enormous opportunities to go back to a conversation that occurred earlier, which is how do you perturb the microenvironment of a, 
of an immunologically cold tumor like pancreatic cancer that's so dense, now applying focused ultrasound, disrupting the microenvironment, breaking it down so that it goes from cold to hot and allows the immune cells to now have access to what was inaccessible. This kind of concept of the physical energy to biological systems will have enormous implications in a whole variety of fields. From the perspective of uh, the immune system, we now know that you can apply electrical energy or ultrasound energy to the vagus nerve, and, and that will create the release of lymphocytes from lymph nodes that are in the intestinal tract. You can also do it by applying ultrasound to the spleen, and when doing that, the spleen will reduce white blood cells or lymphocytes, and depending upon the parameters that you dial into the ultrasound, you can get different kinds of T cells or lymphocytes with different cytokine profiles. So the idea that you can begin to modulate and control the body's immune system, not with a drug, but with physical energy. This field is emerging. It will move from oncology to other areas like neurobiology, and we're already recognizing that you can use physical energy to alter the blood-brain barrier, which allows us to be able to deliver drugs for brain tumors that previously were unable to get into the brain. And there is work, as obviously it's been done, to deal with issues like Parkinson's and even now depression. So the progress and the trajectory that the National Cancer Act created has enabled us to move well beyond where we are with regard to our ability to begin for the first time, treat, manage, and eliminate the threat of cancer in ways that we were never able to do before, to now be able to see that we're moving into an entirely new realm where our, the progress here is leading to a change in medicine as a whole. It is a new era of molecular medicine based on the progress that that National Cancer Act in 1971 catalyzed and enabled. And so the, the, the past is a prelude to the future. The National C Cancer Act of 1971 lives on because of the vision and the leadership of President Nixon. Its accomplishments uh, continue to have wide-ranging uh, ramifications, and it's placing us in a, in a position where we can begin to think about an opportunity to transform the future of millions and millions of lives. One of the things that occurred to me during my career was um, individuals who were interested in writing a book about what was it about cancer patients that seemed to make them heroic and their ability to uh, endure and even overcome their disease. And upon reflection, it seemed to me that there were three characteristics of those patients. They had faith, they had hope, and there was love. The faith was that they had belief in the value of their life and that the fight was worth fighting. Hope was that there was an expectation that tomorrow could be better than today. And love was simply that someone else cared. They were not in this alone. We are at a place where you heard last night Mauro Ferrari refer to uh, love as a word that needs to be imbibed in what we're doing. All of you here today are here because you care, because it makes a difference to you that others will do well. You are creating that kind of love that will enable that kind of heroicism. The National Cancer Act created the hope. The National Cancer Act enabled us to begin to see that tomorrow could be and will be better than today because of the kind of progress that you're experiencing and listening to in this conference. And finally, President Nixon and that those who joined him 
and that National Cancer Act of 1971 created the faith, created the faith and the belief that we would and will do uh, what is necessary to change the world and be able to provide for the people and the patients who are so desperately depending upon us and you. And so it's a great privilege for me to be associated with this conference. Um, it's a great privilege for me to have walked this journey with so many of you, and I am enormously grateful uh, for the honor in which you've bestowed upon me. And as you create that future faith, hope, and love based on that progress, I wish you God's blessings. Thank you. And continue to enjoy your lunch, and our next session will start at uh, noon. Thank you.